Okay, everyone, this is the video lecture for chapter 13. Um, this chapter is fairly lengthy, has a lot of information in it, so I expect that this will probably be at least a three-part uh, video lecture series for this chapter, okay? All right, so in chapter 13, we're talking about what's called interspecific competition. Interspecific competition is competition between individuals of different species, interspecific. You remember in chapter 11, we talked about intraspecific competition, which was competition among individuals of the same species, okay? Interspecific competition is recognized as a fundamental component or cornerstone of evolutionary ecology. Um, if we understand interspecific relationships between different species, this helps us to answer uh, questions such as, how does competition affect the species involved? Um, how does competition lead to species divergence and specialization of different species uh, to be able to partake of various aspects of the resource base and their environment? So, interspecific competition affects populations of two or more species adversely. It affects them both negatively. That's important, okay? And in most cases, in fact, probably in all cases, both intraspecific and interspecific competition can occur simultaneously, so at the same time. So what sort of examples of this do we see in nature? Well, if we look at, let's say, an eastern deciduous forest um, in North America, a forest that you might find, you know, uh, in Virginia or Maine or somewhere else in New England, um, made up mostly of oak trees, maple trees, trees that lose their leaves, well, gray squirrels there compete among themselves for acorns. That's an example of intraspecific competition, but they also compete with other species for the acorns, such as white-tailed deer, uh, white-footed mice, blue jays, wild turkeys, and various other species that, that feed on acorns. So competition then for that very limited resource, the acorn base in the, in the forest, may lead to some of these species actually foraging for other food that is in less demand. So maybe they begin to specialize in other food resources that are being less, um, less intensely utilized by other species. It's easier to get that resource if it's not being competed for as heavily. All right, <clears throat> so you'll remember from uh, chapter 11, we had two basic forms of intraspecific competition. And it turns out we have the same two basic forms of interspecific competition as well. We have, first of all, what's called exploitation, like we mentioned before. And again, this is competition that results from indirect interactions. So individuals in the population are using a resource and that reduces the amount available for other individuals. We also have what's called interference competition. So here, competition is the result of direct interactions. Individuals in a population use resources and prevent other individuals from accessing those resources. So it's more of, an, of a direct interaction of sorts. All right. Now, more specifically with regard to interspecific competition, um, most types of interactions that we see between individuals of different species can be classified um, in one of six categories, okay? We have what's called consumption competition or consumption interaction. We have um, preemption, and we'll go through these here in a little bit. We have what's called overgrowth competition. Um, we have chemical interaction. We have territorial and encounter. Whoops, encounter, okay. All right, so let's go through these. Consumption competition is when individuals of one species in, inhibit or in some way um, stop individuals of another by consuming a shared resource. So the acorn example that we saw, right? You have squirrels that are eating acorns that leaves less acorns for the white-tailed deer, for example. Okay, that's consumption competition. Preemption competition is when individuals of one species prevent occupation of an area 
by individuals of another species. So this is more about uh, competition for space rather than a resource like food. Um, great examples here are sessile organisms, organisms that are sort of attached to one spot all their lives, like barnacles, corals, things like that. If a barnacle is occupying, physically occupying a three-dimensional space on a substrate, that space cannot be occupied by another organism. That's preemption, okay? Preemption competition. Overgrowth competition happens when individuals of a species grow over individuals of another species. So preventing their access to a resource. This is very common in plants, right? So taller plants shading shorter plants, okay? Um, Chemical interaction competition is when individuals of a species release some sort of chemical, like a growth inhibitor or a toxin that inhibits or kills other species, thereby preventing the other species from encroaching on um, the species in question. Um, good example of this, I didn't leave myself much room here, in plants is what's called allelopathy. In allelopathy, plants secrete chemicals, uh, typically from their roots, that inhibit germination of other species. And so it creates sort of a, well, a buffer zone around the plant where other uh, plants of other species have a difficult time germinating. And so that prevents the other species from sort of stealing, I guess you could say, the resources of the plant that's secreting the chemicals. All right. Territorial competition, uh, what we have is the behavior of one species that excludes another species from a certain location that is defended as a territory. So here you have a bird, for example, keeping other birds from nesting in its territory by defending that territory. Okay? In counter competition, the last one is where you have non-territorial encounters between individuals of different species that affect one or more of the species involved. So, you know, maybe you have um, a dead animal carcass on the, on the uh, African Serengeti, and you have scavengers fighting over that. So you can think of, for example, lions fighting off hyenas for access to that um, carcass. Okay, that's an example of encounter competition. All right, so let me um, erase this stuff here. All right, clear that up. Okay, so um, the next thing to talk about is an, is to get an understanding of how these sorts of interactions between uh, different species, these interspecific uh, interactions, how they could affect the growth of the populations of the species that are interacting. Okay, so to do that, we have to talk first of first of all a little bit about um, two mathematicians that were um, fundamental that were very important in terms of developing a conceptual model. Um, for population growth that takes into account interspecific interactions. So we had um, one mathematician named Alfred Latka and another one named Vittora Volterra, sort of a mouthful. They independently developed a mathematical expression to model consumption competition specifically. Okay, so consumption competition. This model is referred to today as the Latka Volterra model of population growth. All right, Latka Volterra model. So the question is how is the Latka Volterra model related to the logistic equation for population growth that we saw in chapter 11? And what then does this Latka Volterra model tell us about the relationship between two competing species? Well, if you remember, the logistic growth equation um, for um, population growth in Chapter 11 took into account um, the birth and death rates, or how it is that uh, birth and death rates could vary with population size. So remember that a population that was small in size could grow very rapidly uh, because it had low uh, death rates and high birth rates. But as the population gets larger and larger and eventually approaches its carrying capacity, its birth rates would decline and its death rates would increase and eventually you'd reach sort of an equilibrium between those two and the population growth would slow down and eventually stop at what we call carrying capacity or K, okay? 
Well, um, if we're looking at the logistic growth equations for two species, say species one and species two, then what we have is um, dn over dt, so dn1 for species one, uh, equals R1 times N1. So remember R is the intrinsic rate of growth. So this is um, intrinsic rate of growth for species one. N is the size of the population at a given moment, again for species one in this case. And we multiply that by one minus the size of population one divided by population one's, whoops, population one's carrying capacity. Sorry about that, okay. Now, if we're doing the same thing for population two, it's the same, except now we have subscripts two, subscript two to denote that we have um, population two that we're considering. One minus, oops, one minus. Sorry guys, I'm really botching that. Back on track here. All right, uh, so R2, so okay, one minus N2 over K2. Okay, so this then is our um, logistic growth model for population one or species one, we could say, and this is the same thing for population or species two. Okay, now the Lock and Volterra model is going to modify both of these equations, or the logistic growth equation, all right? So remember, logistic growth equation that we see here differs from the exponential growth equation we saw earlier in that the logistic equation modifies exponential growth equation to include birth and death rates that vary with population size. And that's what this portion um, or term in the equation actually allows to happen, okay? population size uh, divided by the carrying capacity, okay? All right, so now the question is, how do we modify the logistic growth equation that we see here to model the competitive effect of one species on the population growth of the other? Well, the way we do it is by, and let me um, change colors here. The way we do it is by introducing what's called a competition coefficient. Okay, we're going to introduce a competition coefficient. Let me separate this. All right, so this term then um, includes the population size of the other species, either population one or population two. Okay, and so the competition coefficient then quantifies the per capita effect of species two on species one, and that is alpha. It also, um, it also quantifies the per capita effect of species one on species two, and that is beta, all right? So alpha and beta then are our competition coefficients. Again, alpha, models the effect of species two on species one, so the negative effect of species two on species one, and beta, the negative effect of species one on species two. So the competition coefficients here then are factors that convert an individual of the competing species into the equivalent number of individuals of the species whose growth is being examined uh, or uh, analyzed based on their sh shared use of resources that define the carrying capacity. All right, that was sort of a mouthful, but I think it'll become clear what I'm talking about when I go a little further on here. Okay, so for species one, we have um, the term alpha N2, okay? That accounts for the competitive effect of species two on species one. So alpha N2 accounts for the competitive effect of species two on species one. So we can then uh, rewrite our formula this way. So remember we have dn1, so we're looking for species 1 here, over dt equals r1n1 times 1, oops, 1 minus 
N1 plus alpha N2 divided by K1. All right, so now you see that we've included our competition coefficient term right there, okay? So again, alpha N2 accounts for the competitive effect of species two on species one. This formula is for species one, looking at its change in population size with time, but now we've included the effect of species two. The idea is here that these species, these two species are competing for the same resource, a shared resource, right? And so by including alpha N2 here, that is essentially us including the effect of on that resource of species two. How much of that resource is species two taking away from species one? That's effectively what's going on here, okay? Now, the other term, remember, uh, is beta. And beta, again, is the effect of species one on species two. Okay, so we have a new term, beta n one, and that accounts for the competitive effect of species one and species two. So now that formula becomes dn two over dt equals r two n two, oops, I forget my one, one minus n2 plus beta n1, uh, beta n1, yep, divided by k2. All right, <clears throat> okay. So now again, we've included the competitive effect of uh, species one on species two. So how much of the resource these two share or are competing for does species one get and how does that negatively affect the growth rate of species two? All right, so let's say we have two species of grazing herbivores that are feeding on the same plants. Individuals of species two, let's say, have twice the body mass of species one and therefore probably eat twice as much or eat, eat food at, or consume the resources at twice the rate, let's say. One species two individual therefore equals two species one individuals in terms of how much of the resource they take. So the impact of an individual species two on species one would be alpha equals two. And because species one consumes that resource or that uh, plant at half the rate of species two, the impact of an individual species one on species two would be 0 0.5. So alpha here equals 2.0 and beta equals 0 0.5 in this example, okay? And again, that's because um, species two has twice the body mass of species one, okay? All right. Now, if there is no interspecific competition, let's say that we have two species living in the same area, but they're not competing with each other um, for a resource, okay? or maybe you just have one species. You don't have a second species present, okay? So either way, if there's no interspecific competition, then either alpha equals zero, that would mean that species two uh, effect on species one is zero, or species two doesn't exist, it's not present, all right? Could also be that beta, in other words, the effect of, of species one on species two is zero because maybe species one is not present or the population size of species one is zero, okay? So if beta is, um, if there's no interspecific competition, it's possible that beta equals zero, so maybe they just don't use the same resource or the size of population one is also zero. In that case, population one is not present, population two is, have that free access to all the resource. So the population of each species is going to grow logistically to equilibrium at K, right? You could, you could graph each population growing as if it's on its own, and each one would reach its own carrying capacity. But now the question becomes, well, if they are competing with each other, what happens then to their growth rates, and what happens to the size of the population once um, the combined carrying capacities of both species is reached, okay? What happens then when there is interspecific competition? Well, 
for species one, as its population size approaches its carrying capacity, population growth approaches zero. We've seen that. We saw that in chapter 11. Okay. Now, species two, though, is also competing for the same limited resource that determines the carrying capacity of species one. So we have to consider then the total effect of species two on species one as alpha N2, as we've seen. As the combined population size, N1 plus N2, approaches the carrying capacity of species one, the growth rate of species one approaches zero. The greater the population size of species two, or the greater the competitive effect, alpha, the greater the reduction in the growth rate of species one. So the larger the population size of species two, the smaller the growth rate of species one will be, or the lower it will be, because there's more species two individuals consuming the resource that they share. But also, if we have a greater competitive effect of species two, so maybe it consumes more resource per capita than species one does, that would also reduce the growth rate of species one. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So there are a number of lab experiments that have actually confirmed um, or provided very, very strong evidence for the validity of the lockable Terra model that we've talked about here. And lab experiments are easier, or preferred rather, for looking at this sort of thing because it's easier to determine the outcome of competition under control conditions. All right. So um, let me erase this. There was a Russian biologist um, named G.F. Gauss, uh, who investigated competition between two uh, species of paramecium. We had paramecium, or he looked at rather paramecium aurelia and paramecium caudatum. And so, um, it turns out that, that P. aurelia has a higher rate of population growth and can tolerate higher population densities than P. caudatum can. Um, Gauss placed each species separately in a single tube with a fixed amount of bacterial food. They feed on bacteria, and both of them survive for at least 20 days. That's how he knew he had enough food for each of them. He then placed both species together in a single tube with a fixed amount of bacterial food, and he wanted to see what the results would be. Well, here's what he found, all right? So first of all, um, over here on the right, we have P. aurelia, and down here at the bottom of the right, we have P. caudatum. P. caudatum is the one you typically look at in classes like Bio 1530, when you're looking at cell structure and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so let's look at our, at, our, at our top graph here. All right, here he's looking at the growth rate of P. aurelia. So when P. aurelia was grown in isolation in its own tube, you see that it grew very well. Uh, this is the logistic growth curve. It eventually reached its carrying capacity. Okay, so we have our population density over here measured by volume. All right, now when he grew P. aurelia with or in mixed culture with P. caudatum, he saw that P. aurelia survived, but it reached a carrying capacity at a lower density. So its carrying capacity was significantly reduced, but it still survived. It did not go into extinction. Okay even though it was competing for the same bacterial food resource as P. caudatum was. Um, now, in this lower figure, when P. caudatum was grown in isolation, you see it did well also. Right? It reached its carrying capacity and stayed there for quite a long time. Okay? But when it was grown um, in a mixed culture with P. aurelia, you see it initially ticked up, but then once competition increased, it really sort of started to lose out. Uh, to P. aurelia, okay, and eventually what he saw over an uh, extended period of time, not shown here, is that P. P. caudatum went to extinction. It was, it was out-competed by P. aurelia, all right? Okay, so that was interesting. That showed a very different result um, when the two species were competing directly for the same food resource than compared to when they were uh, grown in isolation and not competing. Gauss then performed similar experiments using P. caudatum and a different paramecium species, P. versaria. And these species actually coexisted in mixed culture. They both reached their carrying capacity and coexisted because of differences in feeding behavior. Turns out P. caudatum fed on bacteria suspended in the solution and P. versaria fed on bacteria at the bottom of the tube. 
So they were feeding on different aspects of their resource base and therefore did not compete directly. And so they both persisted, they both survived. Um, one did not outcompete the other. All right, uh, a biologist named uh, David Tillman investigated competition between diatoms, um, Asterianella formosa and Synedra ulna. Both of these diatoms require silica in their environment to form their cell walls. Diatoms basically have glass cell walls. The population growth and decline were monitored over time, as well as the level of silica in the water. When grown separately with silica continually added, both species kept silica at a low level, meaning they were taking it up and using it. When grown together, silica used by S. ulna reduced the concentration below that needed by A. formosa for survival and reproduction. And so A. formosa was driven to extinction. And here we see that result. So uh, let me kind of zoom in here. All right. So in this top figure, <coughs> what you see is A formosa, right? Here's A formosa, and you see um, its growth rate. So you see the logistic growth curve there, flattening out at carrying capacity, and you see what's happening to the silica concentration in the water as that population grows, okay? So as the population grows, it's taking up the silica, causing silica concentrations to drop and flatten out. All right, now, in the second figure, here we have um, the uh, growth curve for Synedra ulna, right? This is Synedra ulna, and you see again we have basically a logistic growth curve, so it flattens out the carrying capacity, and you see what happens again to the silica level, okay? Same basic pattern we saw for uh, A. formosa. Now, in mixed culture, what we see is that we have, a, again, a decline in silica concentrations, but at this point, um, Synedra ulna is able to outcompete Asterionella formosa for that, for that silica and eventually drives the silica to such low concentrations that A. formosa cannot survive and it goes to extinction. So ulna here is, is definitely outcompeting formosa for that shared resource. All right, so, oops, sorry about that. So based on studies like, like that with, between, uh, for Gauss and Tillman and so on, um, there, there's a fundamental concept developed in ecology referred to as the competitive exclusion principle. Okay, the competitive exclusion principle. This basically says that complete competitors cannot coexist. Okay, so what is a complete competitor? or what are complete competitors. Complete competitors are two distinct species that live in the same place and have exactly the same ecological requirements, meaning they require the same resources, okay? So the competitive exclusion principle says that if you have two species that require exactly the same resource, food, nest sites, whatever it might be, one of them will eventually outcompete the other and drive the other to extinction. That's the competitive exclusion principle, all right? Okay, now, this requires that the competitors, again, require exactly the same resources, and it also requires that environmental conditions remain constant. All right, well, those conditions rarely exist for this to happen in nature, but the principle does raise important questions, such as how similar can two species be and still coexist? and what ecological conditions are necessary for species that share a common resource base to coexist, okay? Well, research suggests that many factors affect um, the outcome of interspecific competition. Environmental factors that influence the survival, growth, and reproduction of a species, but are not resources that are consumed, um, are important. And so there we're talking about, for example, temperature, pH, okay? Temperature and pH. So again, these are environmental factors that influence survival, growth, and reproduction, but they are not resources that the species are consuming, right? In addition, we have spatial and temporal variation in resource availability. So variation in resource availability uh, is an environmental factor that 
can influence survival, growth, and reproduction. We have also competition for limiting resources. All right, and finally, we have what's called resource partitioning. Resource partitioning is when species that do initially have very similar resource requirements begin to utilize or use different aspects of the resource base in their environment as a means of avoiding competition. Okay, so partitioning or dividing up the resource base so that they're not competing with each other directly. All right, so these factors then affect the, out the outcome of interspecific competition. Um, and again, environmental features that are not resources can influence the outcome of competition between species. Okay, these are non-resource factors. Uh, the effect of water temperature, as an example of this, the effect of water temperature on competitive ability of three fish species was examined in both field and lab experiments. Uh, three species from Rocky Mountain streams. They had, um, let me just go on to um, the next slide here so you can see this. There were three species of, of fish from Rocky Mountain streams. Uh, you have what's called brook trout. Uh, brook trout <clears throat> are most abundant at high elevations. So streams that are, you know, near their origin up in the mountains, for example. Uh, you have brown trout, which are most abundant at middle elevations, and then creek chub, which are most abundant at lower elevations. Um, the interference competition is known to influence the relative success of these species when they live together. So there was a study where fish from each species were gradually acclimated to seven different test, uh, test temperature, uh, temperatures ranging from 3 to 26 degrees Celsius. Fish from each species were matched by size, so about a less than 10% difference in size within each size class, and placed in an experimental stream together. The species that consumed the highest number of food items was deemed to be competitively superior. The question was here, or the aim of the study was to figure out how water temperature affected competitive ability. All right, well, based on the results that we see in this graph, it turns out that um, fish from the middle elevations are most competitive at moderate water temperatures. All right, so what you see, again with our orange line, that's our brook trout, and you see brook trout did very, very well at low temperatures, and again, brook trout are the, the higher elevation species, and in higher elevation streams, you generally have lower temperatures. We talked about the temperature profile of the stream as it runs from a mountain down to um, sea level in a previous chapter, right? Temperatures warm as, as you go to lower elevation. All right, so uh, brook trout did very, very, very well um, in terms of their competitive ability, how much food they got at low temperatures, but as temperature increased, you see that their competitive ability dropped and early on, they were overtaken by brown trout, which do better at mid-elevations along that stream gradient, okay? They did very, very well for a long time over a very broad temperature range from about, what, four or five degrees up to about 24 or so. But then at about 25 or 26, their competitive ability just tanks. And that's when you see the competitive ability of creek, creek chub, which is very low over most of the temperature range, really taking off rapidly at about 25 degrees Celsius or so. Um, and you can see that brook trout dropped down to effectively zero. They stopped eating at a temperature of about 24 degrees. Okay. So, um, Subsequent experiments uh, along these lines with these three species of fish showed these temperature-related related differences in food intake were due to temperature-driven differences in competitive ability and not to any effects of temperature on appetite. So these differences that we're seeing here are direct results of temperature increasing or decreasing the competitive ability of these species. It's not an effect of temperature on their appetite. Okay, we're going to stop there for uh, this first video lecture for chapter 13, and we'll pick up um, uh, at this point with the second one.